this is one of those uh, chapters, well, like anything we come to in the Bible, you just, you can't, you can't say enough, right? Um, we looked at the first nine verses of Ecclesiastes 8 a couple weeks ago. We're looking at the rest of the chapter now, verses 10 through 17, and, um, you know, it's just cool. As you, as you read God's Word, you recognize that, that it, it may be the only thing in this life under the sun that is inexhaustible. You, you, you just can't ever, you can't ever run out. It just doesn't run out. God has no limits. And um, that certainly my experience as I was, I was preparing this sermon. Um, we're going to talk about some things, as we said already, knowing God and uh, knowing ourselves and relationships. But let's go ahead and read first the rest of chapter 8 here from the book of Ecclesiastes. Beginning at verse 10. Solomon says, Then I saw the wicked buried. They used to go in and out of the holy place and were praised in the city where they had done such things. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow, because he does not fear before God. There is a vanity that takes place on earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go well with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on the earth, how neither day or night do one eyes, one's eyes sleep. Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. This is the word of the Lord. Better than gold, sweeter than the honeycomb and the drippings of the honeycomb. Solomon began chapter 8 by asking the rhetorical question, who is like the wise? A godly, wise man or woman who knows God and knows himself and becomes skilled in living is living his best life ever. More so than the, the richest or most famous person you can think of. The, the most educated or most powerful or most successful person on the planet cannot hold a candle to the, the average Joe Christian who fears God and possesses godly wisdom. That's the heading of this section of the chapter. If you have your Bible with you, you see there, actually they put in there, those who fear God will do well. And it's true. Wisdom is knowing God and knowing self. Knowing God and all things in relation to God. That, that, that's the lens that we need uh, to, to observe the world through. That's the decoder ring that we use to decipher God's providence. But there, there's a limit to that. Solomon admits that at the end of the chapter as, as he has elsewhere in previous chapters. You won't be able to attain a level of wisdom that lets you see God's plan fully that's not on the table for us. But knowing God and, and all things in relation to God help, helps us get a grip. It helps us accept the providences of God even when we can't understand them. So there's your bookends of the chapter, okay? Wisdom, good, right? Wisdom, limited. That's kind of how it begins and ends. What we see here is that life under the sun can be more than just tolerable if we fear God, acknowledge Him as sovereign, and define ourselves according to His purposes for us. The prescription here then is to look up before looking out. And that's the, the title of the sermon, looking up and looking out. We look up before we look out. 
None of what we see out here is going to make any sense, and it's just going to frustrate us if we don't bend with, begin with God and, and look up at the one who, who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them and, and governs all of his creation. And looking out includes looking in the mirror too. It, knowledge of self begins with knowledge of God. You, you don't look inward for answers. We don't look inward for, for meaning and for purpose. We look up. So with that top view of these verses, we'll, we'll get into some more and look at two points. Simply knowing God and knowing self. And some, some practical ways that that works out in our lives. So first, knowing God. The first thing I want to say here seems obvious but I want us to sincerely take it to heart. There's a vast difference between knowing about God and knowing God. The space between those two things, I mean, you fit a galaxy inside of it. There's a tremendous difference. I mean, how many, how many self-professing Christians know plenty of facts about God, but they're strangers to him? How many people claim to know God, but you can tell as you talk with them and hear them talk about their life circumstances, trials in their lives, or, or current events going on in the world, they have no real understanding of who God is and, 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 and how he operates or how he expects us to operate. That's the first thing I want to say. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And here's the second thing. You can know God. You can know God. He lets you. Isn't that sweet? That's amazing. You know, unbelievers will sometimes say stuff like, oh, all religions are the same, just a bunch of gods with different names, and, and you know, it's all the same thing. No, it's not. Our God lets us know Him. You, the, the Israelites said, for, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? That's what Moses says, Deuteronomy 4, 7. He is near to us. God is transcendent. He's, he's so much bigger, so high above, so other than all of his creation, and yet... He knows us intimately and allows for us and invites us to know him intimately. How do we get to know God? How do you get to know anyone? You know, you have to open your ears and open your mouth. Use your brain and talk, converse. We're communic communicative. That's right, isn't it? Communicative. We're communicative creatures because God communicates, and we're made in His image, right? You, you want to get to know anybody. You want to get to know God. You, you talk to Him in prayer. You listen to Him and His Word. That's how we get to know God. And He's so inviting. Jesus was like that, wasn't He? It didn't matter who you were didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter to him that you didn't matter to anyone else. You mattered to him. You matter to him. He knows you and you can know him. And knowing him will help you know yourself. It will improve your relationships with other people and improve your entire outlook on life. That's what godly wisdom affords you. That's what Solomon means when he says it will be well with those who fear God, verse 12. He says he knows it. He knows it will be well with those who fear God. And Solomon's mentioned already there are limitations to wisdom. It's good to have. You should get it. You, sh you, you, you should search for it as for silver and gold, he says in Proverbs. But it will not let you see the future or add another day to your life. And then here in verses 10 through 13, he says, wisdom won't even really help you explain things in life that seem unfair. And that's true. And the example he uses is one of a guy who's passed away that was a wicked man. He, knew, he, he saw the way this guy rolled. He was judging him. But he could see how this guy rolls, right? And he was a wicked man. And then after his death, everybody wants to like, you know, say things about him that aren't true and pretend that he was a righteous man. 
He says, that's not right. That shouldn't happen. That's vanity. That's not fair. And witnessing those kinds of things, even if it's not that specific thing, right? But witnessing those kinds of things in life stings. And wisdom isn't going to soothe that pain. Wisdom won't soothe the pain of seeing justice not being served speedily, he says in verse 11. And it won't ease the tension we feel when we see the wicked prosper. But here's what wisdom will do, he says. Yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked because they do not fear God. Wisdom doesn't always give us the why, but it does give us the who. Wisdom won't help us see why all these things happen under the sun, but it will remind us who's running the show. That brings a level of peace and comfort. And as Solomon said repeatedly, fearing God is the answer. Fear God. It ends well with those who fear God. And, you know, you say what Solomon said other places in in Ecclesiastes since we've been cruising through this book, that the righteous and the wicked, they meet the same end. Everybody dies anyway. Yes, that's true. But Solomon doesn't believe death is the end. And it ends well for those who fear God. It does not end well for those who don't. What Solomon's getting at is wisdom will drive you crazy if you think it's going to help you make perfect sense of everything. He says again in verses 14 through 17, righteous people suffer as if they were wicked. And wicked people prosper as though they were righteous. You'll go crazy trying to figure that out. But the solution is simple, and he gives it over and over again. Fear God. It goes well despite appearances for those who fear God. It does not go well despite appearances for those who do not. Wisdom, y'all, is knowing that. That wisdom makes navigating life more than just tolerable. It gives us hope and it lets us know we can count on something. We can count on someone who never fails. We live by faith and not by sight, don't we? We as Christians, we, we, we hear that, right? We live by faith, not by sight. And our, our goal in life is not to improve our sight. Our goal in life is doing what's pleasing in God's sight, delighting ourselves in his commandments and encouraging one another to do the same. And he sorts the rest out. Knowing God and all things in relation to God, looking up before looking out, equips us for life's challenges and reminds us we have a Father in heaven who loves us, who watches over us, who who cares for us, who who knows us and wants to be known by us, and we can, we can know him. We were made for it. We were made to know him. You know, when Jesus is talking about eternal life, he actually, he actually defines it. And it's, it's not just riding a cloud in the sky somewhere, right? Here's, here's what he says. Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, John 17, you can look this up. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowing God's more than just knowing about him, and he lets us know him. He lets himself be known by us. And Solomon keeps saying, fear God, and he's the same one who said in the beginning of Proverbs, sets up the whole book. He says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Our fear of God, our awe-inspired reverence for him is the access point. It's fear of God acknowledging, <laughs> acknowledging his greatness, his power, his might, right? That, that awe-inspired reverence, that fear of God is your soul's on-ramp to knowledge of God. You can tell if someone knows God or not just by whether or not they fear him. To know God is to fear him, isn't it? 
And it makes us uncomfortable because, you know, God's our Father. He's our Heavenly Father. He loves us. and all, It's all true, okay? Did you fear your daddy when you were little? Did you have sort of this awe and admiration and respect for him? Of course you did. That's what we're talking about, that awe-inspired reverence of God, a recognition. This man could crush me, <laughs> right? Another story about my dad. I remember he told me the first time he saw the ocean. He grew up in Michigan, and he drives down to Florida, decides he's had it with Michigan. Uh, this is way before I was born. He was a young man, maybe 20 years old. And he goes and he stands on a beach for the first time. He'd only ever seen it on TV, right? And color wasn't all that great on television then, right? We didn't have 4K and all that kind of thing. Sorry to date you, Dad. It's obvious, though. This is the first time he's seen an ocean. He's standing there on the beach, and his first thought, he said, was, that could kill me. Right? Seeing those waves rolling in, just this vast horizon of an ocean, right? He still swam in it. <laughs> That's the idea. To know him is to fear him. Have you ever known anyone who claims to be a Christian that just is really flippant about their religion? Maybe they haven't darkened the door of a church since they were a teenager and now they're 40 and you're inviting them to come, you're encouraging them to come, and they're like, oh, I don't need all that, man, I'm good. You know, I had all that when I was a kid. I've been baptized. That person does not know God. If they did, they wouldn't even have to know much about him, okay? But two things would be certain. They would know that they are a sinner deserving of his holy wrath. And that two, they would not have been forgiven had it not been for the grace and mercy of this loving God. Right? They would at least know that. At a minimum, they would know their lack and recognize their great need. Fear of God is knowing God. That's transitioning to the next point, knowing self. Knowing God leads to knowing self. We want to know God and all things in relation to God, and that includes ourselves. In the first several verses, Solomon's making judgments, isn't he? Isn't he being a little judgy? He's talking about people who do evil things. Evil. Evil things? He's talking about righteous people. Suggesting it's, it's, it's not right that good people get what evil people deserve and vice versa. Where does he come up with that? Where does he get this idea that there's some behavior that's good and some behavior that's bad? How does he come up with the notion of, of what's just or unjust? You know, I mentioned this before in an earlier sermon in the series, something C.S. Lewis said. He said, a man cannot call a line crooked unless he has some idea already of what a straight line is. All of us find that straight line, that standard of moral measurement, by looking up before looking out. The only straight line is the very character of God. Any other lines we find out here only vary in degrees of crookedness. We start with God. We start with His character. And what is God? What is God? That's a question in the uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism. You know, one of the things that we hold to as a, as a Reformed Presbyterian church. Um, what is, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's what God is. God is holy. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. He's good. He never lies. He can't lie. With that knowledge now, okay, with that knowledge, looking up and finding that point of comparison, let's look out on ourselves and others. What is man? Fallen. Totally depraved. And if y'all aren't familiar with that term, you know, people can get turned off hearing that totally depraved. That doesn't mean you're every bit as wicked as you possibly could be. It just means you have the capacity for it. You are totally, in all of your faculties, fallen. Fallen in your reasoning. Fallen in your, fallen in your morality. Fallen in need of being redeemed. You have no redeemable qualities in you. That's what totally depraved means. That's who we are. Not sovereign either. 
As we look at ourselves using God as this comparison, learning about God, knowing God first as we begin to examine ourselves. We're not sovereign. We know we're not in control. If we've forgotten that, we'll know it by the time we leave here this afternoon. We're not in control. We're not eternal either. We're not eternal. We're finite creatures. Life is but a breath or a vapor. Hasn't Solomon been reminding us of that in Ecclesiastes over and over? Life is but a breath. We're finite creatures, but with immortal souls. And because we are immortal souls, we've got more important things to worry about than just what's down here under the sun for the short time that we're here. We've got eternity to think about. And, and, and thinking about that eternity should shape our ideas and, and behaviors while we still are here under the sun. But we've got eternity to think about. And as we do, here's what we realize. We are not holy. We're liars and hypocrites and we're selfish. That's who we are. We, we can't get there, though, right? Because we love ourselves, boy. We don't get there until we look up first and understand who God is and his character. It's humbling. Coming to a true knowledge of ourselves is where we're really being honest about our condition. And that begins with knowing God. We start with him. We start by looking up. And by the time we look down, we see we fall way short and don't possess the ability or even a strong enough desire to fix it. Beginning with God in order to know ourselves ultimately reveals this. We are unable to save ourselves. And self-improvement is, is a fool's errand. But God's promise is that he will sanctify those he justifies. He, he will grow you. He will mature you. He will grow you in righteousness and holiness for his name's sake. And it will be for your benefit. He corrects those he loves and he makes his saints more like Jesus. You know, we live as Christians knowing that once we were not the people of God, but now we are the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Second Peter chapter 2. We are a people for God's own possession, created in Christ for the good works that he's prepared for us. Now, apply that knowledge to all of your relationships. With that understanding, begin to address what you're looking for in a spouse, those of you that aren't married yet. If you've got your eye on someone, they seem wonderful, and they're not a Christian, and they're not interested in walking in the good works prepared for them, you move on, and you don't think twice about it. That is not your mate. That's judgy, isn't it? Y'all, we make judgments all the time, and that's when you can't afford to miss. As you consider your relationships with other people, you first consider your relationship with God. Knowing God begets a true knowledge of self, and knowing self frames how we're able to relate with other people. If you think about it, isn't it having too high opinion of yourself or being too self-focused? Isn't that what destroys your relationships, right? If you're not the one that's being super self-focused, the other person is. But that's what it comes down to. It's, you know, as I've had the opportunity to, to counsel some folks, whether formally or informally, in the church, out of the church, it, it's, I've come to recognize it's always only ever the same root issue. The only thing that changes are the names and the faces, and a few of the details of the, of the situation. But it's pride. It's self-love. It's selfishness. It's resistance to dying to self that causes difficulties in personal relationships. Either by one party or by both. Knowing who you are in Christ and how you came to be in Christ in the first place is the lens or the filter through which you should see your relationships. And as you begin to do that, things change. 
Begin to apply that knowledge to yourself to what your goals are for raising a family. Right? Be honest with yourself. Consult God first. Think of who you are in, in light of who God is as you, as you think through your tendencies or maybe even your deficiencies as a parent. You know, we feel those. With that knowledge, determine how you ought to conduct yourself in business or what career path you might take. You know, ambition's good, healthy ambition. There's such a thing as healthy ambition. But what's it for, right? Is it for you, for your status? So you look sharp and snappy for folks? So that you get all the toys that you can't take with you when you die anyway? Right? Knowing you are naturally selfish and self-serving, how do you approach people who are just like you? That's tricky. We, we start with God. That's what we do. We all suffer from the same curse of sin. All of us do. And if we all look up before we look out, we'd recognize our lack. We'd be humbled. We'd be able to recognize our need for forgiveness and for grace and for mercy. And we would be enabled, having received it from God, to freely give it to others. Solomon looks out on the hurt and injustice in the world and the way people treat each other, and he laments it. He recognizes wisdom will only get him so far, too. God's secret will is not something finite beings can peer into. It'd be like a nutshell containing an ocean. We, we just can't go there. But it goes well for those who fear God. That's what we do know. We know it ends well for those who fear God, but it generally goes well, too, in this life. Because knowing yourself and knowing others in light of who God is and has made you to be provides a tremendous advantage in life. That godly wisdom is, is more precious than anything. You read through Proverbs, Solomon uses, uh, he, he personifies wisdom and folly in these characters, these female characters, because it's primarily written to young men, right? It's for all of us. But at the time of him writing, it was instructions for young men. And so what he does is he, he personifies wisdom as a, a beautiful woman that you should go after with all of your might. And then Lady Folly, who's also a beautiful woman, but she's going to drag you off. The, right? You read Proverbs, you get that picture. This godly wisdom, y'all. I mean, do you believe him? He says, go get it. And it's here. It's here for us. And you can have it. And it makes a difference. It affords you the ability to love the unlovely. That's how it helps us in our relationships. It affords you the ability to love the unlovely because you realize you're not all that lovely. It affords you the ability to forgive people who don't deserve it because you know you've been forgiven much and you didn't deserve it. It makes it a little bit easier. That knowledge will transform your relationships with other people, y'all. Because first, it transforms you. By starting with God, by looking up before looking out, you are transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans 12 says. And that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And there's a lot of weird stuff going on in the world and in our own country right now. But don't, don't keep your gaze fixed down here. Don't be discipled by the headlines and the talking heads on the media outlets. Start with the source and form your opinions there. When people disagree with you or even despise you for your opinions, you can still love them anyway and be completely free of any guilt or, or, or doubt. You know, that's what building your, your, that's what building your house on the rock instead of the sand looks like. You remember Jesus said that? That wasn't just a cute metaphor, right? If your house is built on the rock, if Christ is your foundation, winds and storms shouldn't be able to shake you so easily. And if you are shaken, if you're shaken recently, shaken in your outlook or shaken in your relationships with people, remember who you are and whose you are. Before you look out on the world and all the people in it, look up to the one that made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. 
and be transformed. Best I can tell from Scripture, that's God's plan for changing the world. Did you catch that? According to Scripture, that's God's plan for changing the world. One soul at a time, and generation after generation, until Christ returns and presents the kingdom to his Father after having made every enemy a footstool for his feet. The church is his army, and his weapon is this word. God, let's go there, right? Let's know it. Let's know why we believe what we say we believe. Let's, let, let's, may it make a difference in our lives. I, I just, I do, I wonder, you know, um, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about you know, present company excluded, okay? And if this hits a nerve with you, that's good. That's the Holy Spirit hitting that nerve. That's not me, okay? Do you ever just feel like, man, the church has lost its punch? You know, in our society, in our culture? Do you ever just feel like it's lost its punch? Didn't Jesus say something about that? Losing your saltiness? You know what salt does primarily? We use it to taste things up a little bit, right? It's a preservative. It's a preservative. I think we're losing our punch. I think in a lot of ways, where we've had all this advantage, right, and, and this new world that people fled persecution from to start a new world, right? Where we could, we could build one nation under God. Uh, despite all the advantages and, and despite some of the relative ease, I don't know if we allow God's word to really influence on a level where it's daily affecting our choices our career paths, our families, what we watch, who we do business with. It just... Resolve this morning. We'll close with this. This wasn't the way that I, I thought I planned to close, but can we just make a deal? We can't, we can't handle everybody else out there, okay? We're not responsible for them. We're responsible for us. Like Foster said earlier, right? God, give us what we need for today. Not yesterday or tomorrow, but for today. Can we just resolve to know God a little bit better this week? Just here, this small group of people, this little family church right here, can we just resolve to know God better a little bit this week? Baby steps, right? Can we just start small. Know God just a little bit better. We know where to find Him. He's never hiding. And he's always listening. Know God better. It's what we were made for, y'all. It's what we were made for. Because you were bought for a price and you're able. You have that right and that privilege to know God. So may the Holy Spirit move in each of you this week to, to lay hold to that truth, to pursue him. I wasn't planning on laying down a, a, a challenge. Y'all on board? You can talk to me. It's okay. We're, we're done. I'm done. Can we do that? Like, that's not hard, is it? Like, can we just take that small step and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to beat myself over, or, over it, right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not in danger of losing my salvation because I didn't read my Bible last week. It's not what we're talking about. But can we be intentional? Can we be purposeful? Can we say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that baby step. I'm going to move closer to God this week. I know where to find him. I know that he's listening. And to get to know him better, I've got to talk to him. And I've got to listen to him. Can we do that? Let's just start small. You in? You with me? All right. Let's pray. Father, we read that in Christ are hidden all the mysteries of God. And I ask this morning, Lord, as Paul did for the church at Colossae, that we may be filled with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, 
so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to you, Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. You have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God, those are great words. Marinate our hearts in these truths this week. And may it make all the difference in the world and in our lives for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' holy name, amen.